you know, when we were growing up, we were poor. We didn't have any money. We didn't have anything. And what allowed my family to kind of move up out of poverty, all of those programs and all those support mechanisms and free lunch at schools and, and, and job development programs. By the time I was really getting into in the, poly, in the late 80s and early 90s, those programs were being all slashed. And I was like, you know, we can't allow us to just disenfranchise an entire, entire generation of Americans. Peace, peace, and welcome to another episode of Cook on Monday Morning. At Cook on Monday Morning, we are building lives and make us excited about Monday morning. We believe that if you can own Monday morning, you can own the week. If you can own the week, you can own the year. And if you change your year, you can change your life. Today's guest, Mr. David Greco, is uh, the executive director of All Stars Helping Kids. Uh, before that, he built an incredible career helping to uh, build and make impact in the nonprofit space. He's also a professor teaching young leaders or uh, not so young leaders <laughs> to enter the space to make impacts of their own. I'm excited to get into his personal story the work he's doing with all stars and hopefully by the end of this we'll all be all stars like <laughs> like mr greco thank you sir i appreciate you joining me today oh well thank you for having me it's such a pleasure to be here how did the connection with all stars helping kids happen well, you know they um they they had reached out to me um i was at the time i was living in los angeles i was running a consulting company we worked with nonprofit organizations and uh, but my background really in the sector was oftentimes helping groups that are really looking to kind of scale or grow or they're really wanting to expand programs. And I'm one, I'm one of the guys they bring in to kind of help do that. And so they were all stars helping kids at the time um, was really looking to think about how can we take this program to kind of just a, a different level. And uh, so they reached out to me and we, we started talking and, um, and we both fell in love, I got to say. I, re- it was, I was like, I remember that first interview walking out and just being like, yeah, that's, that, that's, that's the job right there. Yeah. So you were running something and you decided to step away to do this full time. Yeah. I mean, you know, I had really had, I had built um, over the years a, a really, uh, at least for me, I mean, it kept me extremely busy. A consulting company. We work with nonprofits. Our job is really help nonprofits understand what did it really cost them to do their work and how could they build business and revenue models that cover that full cost so that not only could they deliver on mission, but they could also be financially sustainable. And, you know, when you think about financial sustainability, that's one of these things that I think nonprofits are, and funders are always looking for. So we were really, uh, you know, I was really sold out. Um, and so when I first came on, I was like, they wanted me to come on sooner. And I would say, well, that's great, except I have all this existing work that I've already committed to doing. Mm-hmm. And they said, so that's fine. You know, you'll, you'll you know, continue to do that. And then as you come up to speed at all stars. So they were really flexible in allowing me to continue to kind of um, honor all my commitments that I made. Um, why I was coming up with on the all stuff. So again, I think it was just that feeling that we both kind of felt that there was something here. Um, and so we were both willing, like <clears throat> for me, I meant giving up my consulting business, moving from Los Angeles back to San Francisco where I'd lived a number of years before. And for them, you know, same thing. I mean, you know, bringing on the executive director is always fraught with risk and it's always a dicey proposition at best. So. I think we were both willing to take a little bit of a risk and step outside of our, some of our comfort zones. Um, and I think that's really what, what it's allowed this to really happen and to, and to work. We, we didn't get a lot, of, a lot of context to what All Stars Helping Kids is and who's involved and, and the type of impact that it's had. So I, I do want to get into that. And I want to get into your, your personal story. I found out about All Stars Helping Kids uh, through Ronnie Lott. And I don't know him personally. Like, that's not my homie. You know, I just saw him on TV growing up. <laughs> but, but yeah, Ronnie Lott is, uh, for people who may not know, this also is a, a Hall of Fame football player who played for the 49ers. So what's the story of All Star Helping Kids and how is it different from traditional nonprofit funders? Yeah, and so <clears throat> we should definitely get into the story of Ronnie. And, 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 and even in that first interview, it was really interesting. But after Ronnie left football, after he retired from the NFL, 
he really started to work in the investing space. And he, and he settled here in Silicon Valley and in, um, in California. And he got into investing in different companies, um, running a couple different types of investment firms. And at one point he was really helping, particularly former NFL players or even current NFL players, really think about their financial, because you know, these guys knew football, but they didn't know necessarily finance. And so really helping them on the investment side. And so when he was really thinking about how do we build a kind of grant program and how can we, re- he had always, him and Karen had, you know, had always, even when he was back at the 49ers, they had always supported um, nonprofits and they had been very charitable. Um, they had funded particularly youth, particularly disadvantaged youth in the Bay Area. But around 2012, they really wanted to kind of think of a, a more formal program. And so Ronnie drew on what he knew, which was the investing space. And to think about how, if I was going to invest in startup uh, for-profit tech companies, what would I do? And he basically took that same idea and said, I want to invest in kind of emerging startup nonprofits that have really innovative ideas um, and that really are focusing on getting youth, particularly youth of color, out of poverty. And and then he said, yeah, listen, if I was an investor, right, it's not a one-time deal. It's not like I just got one check and give that to you and say goodbye, right? You stay with them. You, you are engaged with them. You provide coaching. You provide counseling. You provide assistance. You bring your friends on to help them support it, right? And so he really took that approach where he goes, not only are we providing them, first of all, it's a, it's a three-year program. So we have this, what we call our accelerator program. It's a three-year program. We provide um, $75,000 in, in um, cash funding. We provide quarterly capacity building trainings. We provide uh, one-on-one technical assistance and coaching. And we introduce them to other funders and donors. So uh, that to me really came out of how Ronnie approached and how what he knew from the kind of um, investing world. And that's how you did it in the investing world. And, you know, and, and they all you know, showed great success. And when he took that approach here, um, again, we're seeing the same type of success that he had in the, in the for-profit investing world. Now we're seeing it in the philanthropic and charity space. Yeah, talk a little bit about that success and what the cycle looks like for someone to become a part of the portfolio. You know, for us, what we're looking for is what we think of as, as these kind of uh, what we call the emerging organizations. And they tend to be the groups that are below people's radar. They're small. Maybe they have one or two staff people. $150,000 budget, right? And none of the big funders are going are gonna to touch that because they're too small, they're too risky, right? They're, 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 it's all these kind of things. We want the big established players that we know are going to deliver. And so these groups have real hard time getting traction in the nonprofit space. In the for-profit world, there's a lot of, you know, kind of incubators and accelerators and really how do we focus on growing these tech companies? But in the nonprofit space, you're pretty much, if you're under a million dollars, you're pretty much on your own. There's not a lot of places that are really kind of helping you, uh, you know, kind of you know, get to where you want to get to. So what we look for, though, are those groups that really have a really innovative idea that we think we could really scale with the right type of support. Um, and there's a, you know, there's a certain kind of, you know, we always call it their secret sauce or the DNA but there is something about, I think, with our group that they're very, very adaptive. They're very much, um, you know, when COVID hit, you know, where a lot of people were freaking out and figuring out trying what to do, these groups were like, okay, pivot, we're going to do this, boom, 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 and they moved. They didn't, they weren't sitting around trying to worry and fret about what was happening. They just made decisions and go. And that's part of being small and nimble. You can do that, right? You don't have to turn around the battleship. And so these groups, that's the type of kind of organization we're looking for, that they're young, they're hungry. What Ronnie would often talk about in his playing career is you find this rookie or this you know, young player has some real potential and you kind of take them under your wing, you show them the ropes, the coaches invest in them. And next thing you know, this guy's an all-star and he's heading to the Hall of Fame. And with that same mentality is really what we're looking for. We're looking for those players and those people and those organizations with real potential and if we could just give them a little support and a little push along the way, they're gone. Yeah, I, I thought of all these um, war stories. I guess you can call them those now when I was building Mission Bit. 
and trying yeah. to uh, get funding and be in the net under $150,000 space yeah. and, and looking for like an opportunity to, uh, and, and the, and the grind, the grind it was for, for me to, to do that. It's like, <laughs> it's like I'm getting flashbacks, you know, maybe that's the best, it's not war stories, it's flashbacks. I was like, Whoa, that was, that was uncomfortable. <laughs> This, this year, the organization Mission Bid with the new executive director, Christina, she just raised a million dollars during COVID. And I was like, I'm so proud of her. So proud of Mission Bid. And and so were you ever in that spot building an organization? Were you ever in that like $150,000? Where'd you grow up? Let's start there. Let's start. <laughs> you know, so I was born and raised in Philadelphia. Um, and my initial interest actually was I really wanted to go into politics. And I actually, in, in college, really worked in, um, in politics. I was running, I was on political campaigns and I was doing fundraising on political campaigns. Hmm. I moved down to DC because I was planning to go into national politics. And this was right around 91, 92. Um, and I was having trouble finding a real landing on a campaign until a friend of mine said, hey, there's this great nonprofit called the Horatio Alger Association. And they're looking for some fundraising help. And I said, sure, let me come over. At first, I was just going to help them do like this one event. And but I, I fell in love with the organization. They kind of liked me. I ended up staying there seven years, mm. never went back to politics mm. and have really stayed in the nonprofit sector ever since. Mm -hmm. uh, I really just kind of I think in, in one ways, even though I was going into politics, I think for me, there had always been a sense. I mean, my family, we have a long, long tradition of, of service in my family, my Great grandfather volunteered in World War One. Both of my grandfathers were in World War Two and, and, and um, Korea. My dad was a Marine in Vietnam. I served in the Air Force in the first Gulf War. Um, you know, so we have a long, long history of that. And also, I think you know, when we were growing up, we I mean, we were we were poor. We didn't have any money. We didn't have anything. And what allowed my family to kind of move up out of poverty all of those programs and all those support mechanisms and free in you know, the free school, you know, free lunch at schools and, and, and job development programs that really helped move my family out of poverty. You know, by, by the time I was really getting into, in the poly, in the late eighties and early nineties, those programs were being all slashed. Mm -hmm. right? Everything that I saw that helped move an entire generation of Americans up out of poverty and into prosperity, all of those things were being systematically and intentionally dismantled. And I was like, you know, we can't allow us to just disenfranchise an entire, entire generation of Americans. And so that's really where I was coming from into the political space. And then when I moved into the nonprofit world, the organization that I ended up working with, they focused on, with the, you know, they use this kind of the Horatio Alger story, the rags to riches, which is the idea that there are all these kids out there that don't, that are, are economically disadvantaged, but they're staying in school, they're doing good grades, you know, they're doing everything they're supposed to do, but they just don't have the money to go into college. So we, this organization provided these students with a college scholarship. Mm -hmm. And at that time in the early nineties, it was a $5,000 college scholarship, which was a good hunk of money. And so, but it was to really recognize these kind of economically disadvantaged youth, but who had this real spirit of really striving, continuing, they wanted to do, they wanted to succeed and they just needed a little help and push along the way. And to me, that just really aligned with where I was kind of personally in my own kind of um, you know, upbringing and history. So I, like I said, I fell in love with the work and, mm -hmm. and never looked back. And it's beautiful that your family was, was engaged and, 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 you know, all those service activities that were life-threatening you yourself. Poll worker. So even this past election, she was out there with a mask and every certain things. And she was <laughs> slapping the polls, and she does that every single election. So again, I think that we were coming from a family of, of strong, of strong service. So mm -hmm. a lot of that was instilled by by my my parents. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's amazing. That's amazing. Yeah. Well, as you as you were talking too, um, I mean, with the nonprofit space, I just had on a I just had on a, a good friend. Eric McDonald, he used to be the um, chief marketing officer, chief uh, operating officer of United Way. And he now does like consulting and advising. But with the whole nonprofit sector, if we can call it that, like the sector industry, we don't really celebrate those leaders like we do in other sectors. Yeah. There's no like, 
you know, in the corporate America or in politics or in sports, you know, we have like these figures, but the nonprofit space doesn't really get those sort of um, like that route, that Mount Rushmore, that top 10, you know, like if, with, with some of my guests, I'd be like, oh, who's your, who's your favorite? Who's your top five rappers? Who's your favorite five rappers? <laughs> we, don't, we don't have like a, a top five nonprofit. <laughs> And, uh, and we should, you know, we should. Um, but since you work with these leaders, you teach this work, I'm sure you're familiar with like the components in a general way of what an organization must have or what a leader must have to, to get a, a, a place from A to B. You know, you probably thought a lot about this. How would you respond to that? I said a lot, but <laughs> that... Yeah. yeah, I agree with you, you know, because I often talk about, you know, people, particularly in Silicon Valley, it's like, oh, Steve Jobs, Elon Musk, you know, this person, that person. I'm like, you know, they're great. None of them ever figure out how to make money running a nonprofit, mm -hmm. right? I mean, that's, that's the end of the day is mm -hmm. none of them could figure out a way to do this work properly. And that's why we still have nonprofits. So I agree that nonprofit leaders, you know, I think there's sometimes a knock that they don't, they don't understand business, that they're inefficient. And I'm like, to me, the, 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 the challenges that these groups are facing and tackling and taking on, I, I mean, you know, racial equity, you know, poverty, homelessness, I mean, you know, hunger, climate change, you know, these are, these are global systemic issues that they're trying to grapple and tackle. And so to me, I think that, I think it's a very similar, I think that what, what makes up some of the great nonprofit leaders is this ability to you know, have that vision and understand and have that kind of compassion and a heart for what you want to achieve, but understand that it takes people and organizations and resources and time to achieve that. And, and that you need to not only build a vision and kind of articulate this, this vision of what you want to impact, but you have to build the team. You have to build the organization. It's not enough to say, I want to go to the Super Bowl. Right? You gotta you gotta build that team, you gotta bring the coach on, the general manager, the quarterback, the running back, you gotta build that and you gotta invest in your people. And so for the, for us, the organizations where I see when I see somebody like, wow, they're just they're that they've done an amazing job, it's that they've really been able to build a team around them because there's just no way any individual single leader can can drive this level of change that you're trying to do. We're just trying to there's, you know, I think in, in, in California, there's 4 million kids living in poverty, right? No one person is going to solve that. And you need to recognize, you need to have a team around you. You need to have a board. You need to have an organization with the financial strength, the human strength, the systems, the infrastructure, the measure, outcome measurement. Like to me, that you have to be able to operate on both sides of that. You got to have the heart and the kind of vision but you gotta also you know, know your numbers and be able to actually run the organization. And where I've seen great leaders trip up is they have amazing vision and they have great heart, and, but they can't run an organization. They don't, they can't, they can't and they just, the internal gears grind to a halt just because of organizational inefficiencies. And to me, that's, that's such a shame because they have such tremendous you know, vision and ideas but they're not willing to give, let go of the control to allow people to bring in and really run those other pieces of the, of the business. Mm -hmm. So I, I agree. And I think there have been, you know, I think there are great organizations out there that have done such tremendous work. And if you really think of about the big players and the groups that have really gotten big and kind of being really impactful, right, those are the groups that understood that, you know, we need to, if you're trying to address, I always say this way, if you're trying to address a problem that's not going to be solved tomorrow, right? That means you need to build an organization that's gonna be here the day after tomorrow, and the day after that, and the week after that, and the year after that, and the decade after that, right? It's gonna take generations before we really deal with some of these issues that we're trying to deal with in our society. And so you need to build an organization that's, that's, just, that's able to be around for decades in order to solve that issue. Yeah, yeah, organizational sustainability. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I think we, always, we always want to kind of recognize these great visionary leaders of these great ideas, which is fantastic. But I think as what you were saying is what we don't recognize, you know, it's not that Steve Jobs or, you know, you know Elon, Elon Musk is, you know, 
they have this great vision, but guess what they've also done? Mm -hmm. They built huge companies, right? Yeah, you look at Apple, Apple is not like some (laughs) fly by night operation, right? So Mm -hmm. that Steve Jobs was able to either bring in the people that could really make that piece happen why he focused on his, what his strengths were. And I think in the nonprofit sector, that's, that's a, a very similar approach. You need to have uh, people who are really willing to be able to kind of, you know, do the hard work that's going to take uh, for, to really, and, and to me, if you're really, truly passionate and committed to what you're doing, um, you need to recognize that, 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 that those pieces need to happen. And I think it's just, to me, where I, where I see people fail is, they're they're all hard and and you know just but no ability to deliver on that. There's there's so many directions I want to take this because like you know work work workshopping or talking to you reflecting with you about my own experience running a nonprofit and it's interesting we have a bit of that parallel between like this nonprofit world and the political world right I'm I'm currently elected I'm stepping away from active like elected politics but with the there was there was a crop of of executive directors. Um, when I started running Mission Bit, there was like they were kind of like my peers in the sense that like we all started around the same time, and and we were all doing things in similar spaces, right? So like Kimberly Bryant was running building Black Girls Code, Brandon Nicholson was building Hidden Genius Project, yeah, and I was running Mission Bit, right? And so I saw Kimberly and Brandon like catch a blaze they were like all over the place right <laughs> and i'm and i'm like trying to get to next month like <laughs> they were like in new york times google impact like all of this and i'm like what's going on like why well, i'm not getting no shine you know <laughs> it's really easy to uh, <laughs> to like get distracted on who else is getting whatever um and and lose track of like what the activity is supposed to be for the day. Cause you're talking about like organizational focus, but then there's also some, some daily practices, you know, like what's, what's your routine? Like what, what, how do you organize your days? What does your days look like? You know, for me, and for me, I, 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 a lot of it is, I think that right where we are at least right now, in terms of what we're building at all stars is, you know, I, I've, talk to my staff, I've talked to my board, we have an upcoming board meeting. And I've really been talking about this need to make the investment in the organization, that we need to really build it, that if we want this big program, we need to have a foundation that supports that program. Mm-hmm. I said, I don't, wanna, I don't wanna go out there and raise a bunch of money and then not be able to deliver on the promise of what we, what we raised that money for. So what we're doing, I think for me, where I struggle, I think every day, is the struggle of like, you know, you're just, I want to do that, I want to do that, I want to get there. Oh my God, I'm not doing this, I'm not doing that, I'm not doing this. And you feel like you're constantly failing on that front because you're just not doing enough. But then at the same time saying, no, we need to kind of walk before we can run. We need to make sure you know, we have the pieces in place. We need to be thoughtful about this. We need to be planful about this. We need to really make sure I get buy-in, that I build this consensus around my board and my staff and my funders. And that takes time and that takes effort. So I think for me, the struggle is often this impatience that I have of wanting to just run full tilt at something and just you know, take it, which you know, I also have a founder who that's how he played football, right? It was just like, you know, four seconds at a time and you, know, you can hit somebody as hard as you possibly can and you ran as fast as you could. I, but you also had to kind of keep your head in the game and understand what was going on over the, over the whole arching of the game. You couldn't get, you couldn't let your emotions so blind you that you made a stupid mistake that actually cost you in something in the long run. So for us, I think for me, that to me is oftentimes this kind of feeling of like, I just want to do so much. And I have, I have this incredibly long list of to-do items that are always needing to do, but it's really about, okay, really getting back to that focusing on what do we need to put in place now so that six months from now, we can be you know, launching this bigger and even more impactful program. Or that a year from now, we're gonna be even expanding even more. So to me, that's constantly where I'm at is always making sure, and that I'm, I'm surrounded by a lot of people that 
have, have a lot of experience, I think, in working with startups. And I think that a lot of the kind of advice and counsel my board chair, for example, has given me, it's like, hey, you don't feel this need and pressure just to kind of like, just go out and do stuff and grow things right away. Like, take your time. We're not, we're not in a crisis. We're not in a situation, you know, we want this to be, and, and, and when we, we often talk about a legacy, you know, I think Ronnie and Karen are at a point in their lives I'm at a point in my life where we're really looking at this as this is going to be our legacy. Um, and so we want to do it right. And I think that you only have really one opportunity to do this. And so for us, that to me is like where I, but at the same time, I get like, oh, you know, you're, it's so easy. You're like, you want to do this and this and this. But so for me, I think I, 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 that's the challenge I face every day, mm. um, going in there and trying to keep my, my wits about me. <laughs> <laughs> when you started that, you, you said uh, you don't want to go out and raise a bunch of money. And one of the one of the big things that is difficult for people in these in this work is like asking for money. Mm-hmm. And it's difficult for people in politics too, like, you know, call time or and, and I always did it because I feel like, you know, I had to do it and I developed maybe an approach that works for me. But what what are like the what are the Greco rules on raising money? Like, how do you, like, what, what, what are the things you keep in mind when you're making an ask or an investment or however you frame it to? Yeah, well, that, you know, that's funny because, yeah, when I, when I started in politics, one of the things I did is I ran a, in Pennsylvania, I ran this telephone fundraising bank. And I always tell you, before we had email and social media, we used to have to call our donors and ask for money. When mm-hmm. I had 27 people in this bank, then we would call around the state of Pennsylvania asking for money. So part of that was, I think, there, that, that you start to recognize that there's a, there's a, you know, you, there's a persistence that you just need to have, and you just can't wor- be worried about the nose and stuff like that. But for me, I think in particular, the, the approach that I have always always taken is that, that it really is a, a partnership. It really is a long-term relationship that I'm trying to build. Um, I remember once when I was working for another organization, and we had been doing all this work up, with, up in Seattle with the Gates Foundation. And I remember one of the program officers came to me and he said, you don't try and sell in your workshops. And I'm like, no, that's not really. She's like, yeah, you guys don't, you guys don't sell very well. And I'm like, well, all I know is like, we're growing so fast, I can't hire enough staff. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I said, but because, because I'm not out just trying to sell you a product. I'm, you know, what I'm here is trying to understand from a funder, as a donor, what is it that you're really, what is it that you're trying to achieve? And are we an organization that can help you achieve that? If so, let's talk. And to me, that has always been my approach. I'm, I'm never afraid to make the ask and I'll ask people for money and you, you just, you know, you ultimately need to be able to do that because there's a certain point you build a relationship, but then at a certain point you do, you're all like, all right, the time is right. We need to ask for the money. But all, what I've often found is that before we need to get there, I often have the funder or the donor come to me and say, hey, I'd really like to talk to you about this and how we can figure out a way to partner them together. Because to me, I think that's going to build much longer term uh, relationships. And the organization I was at before I came to All Stars, um, an organization called Nonprofit Finance Fund, um, that's what I did. And we, and we built some great relationships and some great partnerships and funders stayed with us for years. Um, and many of the same people now when I left that we, you know, we become friends and we know each other in the space. And so to me, it really is about relationships. Um, and it really has got to be a win-win situation for everybody. Um, I don't believe in transactional philanthropy, just asking for money, just to get it in the door. I, you know, I'd rather, uh, you know, take some time. And in fact, even when I first came on, I think there was this push that we, oh, we need to go out and, and, you know, make all these asks and, kind of, you know, get the money in. And I was like, let's, why don't we slow it down a little bit? I really think about, you know, I don't want to go, and particularly because I, I would, my concern there was we're going to go out and ask for money and someone's going to give us $50,000. But if I could, if I would have waited, they're going to give us 200,000, right? And so to me, yeah, we can go out and just ask somebody for money, but you're just going to get more of this kind of transactional level commitment. Versus if I spend the time really building the relationship, instead of 50,000, I'm going to get 200,000 or 500 or whatever it is. And to me, that's really where, the, where, where I want to focus my time and effort. 
um, in, in the fundraising space. And I think that's, you know, I think that's, and it's, and it's I think part of the, it aligns very well. It's part of very much the DNA of All Stars. It's how Ronnie and Karen work. They have long-term commitments, long-term friends, you know, long-term kind of what they call, what they describe as the family, the All-Stars family. And I think that's, that's how, you know, that's what, when you build true, authentic relationships with people, even though they're your donors or your board members or your foundation support, right? They, they do, they become, they become family. Do you have kids? I, I do not. I have a stepdaughter. I have a stepdaughter who just okay. graduated. Oh, so yeah. Okay. Yeah, I don't have I don't have kids either or or stepchildren. So, <laughs> um, so, she so with the so she's again. She was sixteen when I met her. Oh, uh, got it, got it. But you, you you're also a professor, correct? Yes. Yeah. And and talk a little bit about your teaching career. So that was you know it's funny it's really interesting is is I remember back when I was in college I always had this idea I wanted to be a college professor I really thought when I graduated college I, that's what, that's the direction I was going to go I was a history and political science major that's really where I, where I wanted to go mm-hmm. then I kind of got into campaigns and I got into some other stuff and and kind of the idea but one of the things that why well, when I when I went into the Air Force. I actually became an instructor in the Air Force. I was, oddly enough, I was a firearms instructor. So, uh, so we had to teach everyone how to shoot the handgun, the M16 rifle, the shotgun, the grenade launcher, and M60 machine gun, right? Uh, so that's what we did. So well, I, don't mess with David. Then you to instructor school, just like a regular instructor school, and you have to do presentations and slides and things. And so they teach you all of that. And so then I was an instructor for many years in the Air Force. And then I, I do a lot of training and workshops. And I, I really just love this idea of kind of educating uh, folks. Um, and really kind of, I think for me, when I came into the nonprofit sector, there wasn't a lot of what I thought of as really just kind of real practical stuff. Like really somebody to listen. If you're looking at financials, don't worry about all this stuff. This is what you really need to pay attention to, right? Mm-hmm. Those kind of things. And that's always been my approach from the team. So then I had this opportunity that uh, when, when I came here back to the Bay Area, University of San Francisco at the time, just happened to have an opening to teach nonprofit finance, um, which, is, which is the area that I really had specialized in. And so I met with the dean, we talked, and I said, listen, I'm not an academic, right? I'm not going to come here and teach academic theory. I want to teach is I, these kids are going to go out into the real world. That's an MBA program. You know, master's program, they're going to go out and they're going to be program directors, development directors, executive directors of nonprofits. I want to teach them real world skills. And he was like, perfect. That's exactly what we want. That's exactly what we want. Mm-hmm. And so I said, all right, let's do it. And so this is my second year now teaching at USF um, in their master's of nonprofit administration program. Um, and I love, I love, I love it. I love the students, the energy that they bring, the excitement that they bring, the curiosity that they bring. And, and, and the other thing too, is a lot of these are out, a lot of these students are working in the space and they're doing amazing work, working for incredible organizations all around the Bay Area. So not only are you helping to kind of just, you know, provide a good education for an individual and they're going to get a master's degree and all of that. But I already had a couple of students come back to me and just say, oh, I took that spreadsheet that you, that you shared with us and I took it back to my work. And I showed them how to calculate liquidity ratios. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I was like, my, my God, perfect. That's exactly what I want to happen. That's exactly yeah. what I want to do, right? Mm-hmm. And that to me is it, that students are taking back to their workplace and in, introducing concepts that like, we taught in class. And I'm like, I don't have to wait like four years for them to like, you know, make an impact. They're doing it right now. So to me, that's just that's something personally that I just really enjoy. Um, and I get, I get super energized from, um, from that. And so we teach on Tuesday nights, um, mm-hmm. you know, this class and it ends, it's from six to 9 PM. But usually like, you know, I finish that class and I'm like, I'm all wired. I'm all, you know, I'm like not ready for bed. I got to, it takes me a while to calm down. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's funny, the students, like you get them talking, it, it, it'll be 20, 30 minutes before I can rein them back in and all okay, mm-hmm. can I actually do need to cover some content today. <laughs> right, 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 right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Not, some of the knock against students are, 
They don't talk. They don't sit there moping, looking at you. Not my group. My group, they, they, they'll, they'll talk and they'll argue and they'll debate and they'll raise questions and mm. they challenge me and they teach me things. Mm-hmm. And there's a lot of stuff because they're in the field and they're in different mm-hmm. spaces in the field. They bring a lot of knowledge to me. And I was like, wow, I didn't know that. Oh, that's, wow, that's really great. Oh my God, I, I had no idea this was happening. And so um, to me, it's a really kind of two-way kind of you know, exchange. I think we're both learning from that experience and, and sharing what we bring, uh, bring to it. And so, and I think for me, I, I want to help really, because, you know, when I was coming into space, you didn't have masters of nonprofit administration. You didn't have any of that, right? You, mm-hmm. There weren't all these trainings and certificates and things like that. We all had to learn by doing it the hard way, mm-hmm. you know, failing more times than we could possibly ever want to admit, um, you know, doing everything wrong. <laughs> mm-hmm. And, uh, and then, you know, here we are now we have this opportunity where they folks can learn from what we we did and but to me again i always always just kept coming back to this really practical knowledge of this is what it really looks like inside an up this is what's really going to happen right. yes the theory in the textbook says this this and this but when you're in that situation i i guarantee you this is what you, this is how you're going to act yeah. and that's okay mm-hmm. that's okay and to be kidding my big thing, particularly around the financials, is it's what I oftentimes is, is, is taking the fear and anxiety out of it. I think a lot of these people, particularly if they're moving into a role for the first time, they're so afraid of messing up. They're so afraid of, of doing something wrong or something like that. And so they all tend to, I'm like, it's okay. It's okay. You're going to learn. Right? And, and I had somebody quote to me today that, you know, that if something doesn't work, it's only a failure if you, if you don't learn from it. And if you've right. learned from it, right, then it becomes experience. If you don't learn from it, then it's a failure. <laughs> and I thought that was really great uh, advice. And that, that to me is, I think, trying to get people to be, it's okay, you know, that this, if you if focus on these pieces and you'll, you'll be all right. And kind of just lower their anxiety about going into these things. And, and again, you know, focus on real world outcomes. Yeah, there's, there's a bunch of... Um practices that I do in my personal life to help reinforce this idea of like continuous learning, like things that are uncomfortable that I'll try out. And, uh, you know, no matter how many things I do to remind myself of that professionally, you can still get that like worked up, like, ah, uh, no, like, you know, disappointment, like whatever it is, beat yourself up, a negative self-talk around or like, um, you know, hesitation to go, you know, like, or, not stepping into the opportunity because it's a, it's like a natural default, a way of like operating. So, you know, it is really important to have that community too. That's like what another important aspect of it. And if your students could get that in the classroom, that's really key. Yeah. Cause I think, and that's great. I, I absolutely agree with that. Cause, and I often make this distinction when I talk to people is this difference between fearless and fearlessness. You know, the idea is when we think, Oh, we should all be fearless. And that means that we don't have any fear. I'm like, that's not how it is. Fearlessness or fearlessness, right, is really the ability to move forward even though you're afraid. Right? You may not know, you're still afraid, but you still go in there into the arena and you still get into the ring, you still go into the game, you still, you still go in, you still step up and you say. And to me, that's what I, I that, that when I see leaders in the space, that they're like, yeah, I'm terrified, but guess, you know, I'm doing it anyway. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, that is the, that's one of those qualities that people really have, because I don't believe there's really people that are true, you know, without fear. Mm-hmm. Um, we all have it. It's a, it's a matter of, do we let it get in our way? And we were talking about that partnership earlier too, the partnership between funders and uh, organizations or investors and organizations. People always ask me how I did so well raising money because, because it was like, it was a lot of rejection and a lot of no's. And, and there was so much desperation initially, like, because, you know, my salary is, <laughs> I had to, and then it became my employee's salary. So it was kind of like, oh my God, like I got to hit this number. But the partnership though, like it doesn't really make sense unless the person is interested in the cause. Like there's, there's a guy that uh, was one of my mentors and I collected a bunch of mentors to help me, um, you know, throughout my career. And, and He's coming from the perspective of a, you know, he he works for like a big real estate firm and um, and he helps an organization. He only has one organization he cares about, 
and he's he constantly talks about it. So with all of his rich friends, his question is like, you know, what what are your philanthropic priorities? And I was like, oh, I didn't even think to ask somebody that, you know, <laughs> it was just like, oh, you got money, then you'll give to me, you know, like you got the money, give to me. <laughs> but, but, but the value is in helping someone get their priorities met, you know? So like, if, if I'm not your philanthropic priority, but if I can connect you to someone that is, then, then it's all in the bank of good value for people that like want to see impact. So um, that's really key. The partnership piece you said is really key. Yeah, and I, I absolutely. And I think that's not only for donors, but for board members, for people that serve on our various committees and volunteer for us and all of those types of things. I think, for, you know, is is because, you know, there's a lot of people that said, oh, I want to help kids or I want to, you know, and, you know, and that's great to you know, help kids. But to me, what I think that like what All Stars does is, is that I think we appeal to particularly, again, here in the Bay Area and particularly in Silicon Valley, this idea of that kind of investor mentality, right? This, this idea that, you know, we're, it's not a just about, it's not a just about a hand out, right? It's about a hand off. It's not about just a, a donation to charity. It's an investment and in impact, right? And so it, for us, I think that, that, that there's a certain set of donors that we really work with who are not just about, well, I want to give some money to a, a good cause and helping some nonprofit. They really are thinking about how can we put like systemic change? How can we put systems and organizations and create an ecosystem that we can really truly impact the lives of youth in, in the Bay Area? Mm -hmm. And for us, that's the type of investor we want. That's the type of donor we want, right? Somebody who's really interested in understanding that this is going to take time and effort and like really, you know, we need to commit to this uh, mm -hmm. full tilt in order to, for it to happen. Those are the folks that we really try and bring along with us and kind of share in that experience and share, you know, the, what the, and then we, we, it's, I think it's really, really important to kind of report back and say, Hey, here's what your investment has allowed to happen. Mm -hmm. um, and you can see, we took an organization that was, you know, had no staff, right? It was just kind of an idea, a concept. Now it's a $2 million organization and, and it's expanding into LA and it's doing these things. Like to me, that's it. That's, that's where the, I think the, 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 uh, the real impact is. I think for me, when I see, you know, and you know too, you, you go around, you walk around in, 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 in the Bay Area and, and you go to all the different communities and we're in all, we're, you know, all, 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 all over the place. And, but you talk about who are they doing the real work? And it's not oftentimes not the big name players. It's a lot of these little community-based groups with, the, with their, their people from the community, their staff by folks from the community, they serve the community. And they don't look at these people as, oh, you guys are our clients. You're my neighbor, right? <laughs> you're, you're, you're my your kid's teacher. You're my, you know, you're my kid's best friends. You know? and, and so to me, like there's this, those are the ones that are really, I think, um, having some a tremendous impact out there. And because they're not doing it the old, same old way that was mm -hmm. always, kind of, this is how it's been done. This is how education's done. Right? And, so, and they're, they're, they're recognizing problems um, and they're, they're coming up with really kind of amazing solutions to these issues, but they're on nobody's radar. Mm -hmm. And so for us, when we think about that, like there's a certain type of, I think, uh, kind of donor, a certain type of organization that really kind of gets that. Whereas other people are like, you know, same thing, United Way is great, Red Cross, you know, all of those, you know, Destination, there's so many tremendously great organizations in there, but it's kind of a little bit like your stock portfolio, right? Mm -hmm. You can invest in all blue chip, right? You can invest in all the big, you know, Fortune 500 companies and that's fine. That's a perfectly valid investment strategy. Mm -hmm. And same thing in the nonprofit sector. If you want to invest in all the big players, the big established organizations, great. Um, but if I buy 10 shares of Apple stock, is that a transformational gift for Apple? No, that's a, you know, yeah, they're, right, they're, right, right. that's a rounding error in Apple. Mm -hmm. And it's the same thing. Like for, for if, you, if you give some money to these big organizations, that's fantastic. But if you're looking for transformation, if you're looking for really kind of scaling some, some, some different types of programs, you have to focus on those kind of 
those emerging uh, markets, those uh, kind of startup organizations and all of those uh, that work, that's where the action is. And, mm-hmm. and so to me, I just, I just, I get excited when I, when I even meet potential grantees and folks that are thinking about applying to our program or people that have applied and we're kind of helping them get through the process. Um, I'm just like, man, I want to, you know, you do, you want to fund them all. You would think, oh, all of these would be great, mm-hmm. but we can't take them all, right? We, mm-hmm. uh, mm-hmm. You know, we have far more applications than we have slots available for our, for our grant making. Right. Uh, that, that makes it tough. I mean, and, and it gets tough to kind of, you know, you have to kind of finally cut that line. It's like, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. but you know, we, you know, at the end, we, we walk away with some amazing nonprofit partners doing mm-hmm. incredible work in communities. And then when we report that back to our donors and our funders, they, they, you know, in, you know like the hidden genius projects of the world, right? And, and, mm-hmm. uh, and those types of things that people just, next thing you know, our donors are now their donors, our donors are now on their board. I just gave so much money. That I'm like, nobody told us that. <laughs> right? Yeah. yeah. We just, what we train them to do. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I, I had Brandon on the podcast. Um, I like him a lot. Um, and, uh, you know, when you mentioned you, you, you were more, you, you were way more tactful in how you talked about the Red Cross. And, uh, cause I, cause I, I, I developed like this, this, um, what is it like a phrase? Like I call it like the Red Cross effect, you know, like some organizations reach the Red Cross effect when like everyone knows their name, but nobody mm-hmm. knows their impact. You know, <laughs> and so there's like, you know, and you may know people at the Red Cross, you may have shared donors, so you don't have to say any of this. This is this is Steve on talking. This is not David talking. <laughs> the Red Cross. Like I've I you know, I don't I don't I don't know what time I don't remember when I first heard about the Red Cross, but I don't ever remember not hearing about the Red Cross. But I've yet to meet one person that spoke like highly about the impact the Red Cross had on our life. It's mostly mostly what I hear about is like if, if a disaster happens, the Red Cross is who you think about. But then the aftermath of that disaster, I, I never really heard the story of like the Red Cross really transformed this community. I've heard that like the Red Cross like took advantage of this community. So I put that aside, right? The Boys and Girls Club, the YMCA, uh, even United Way, like uh, lots of real estate, lots of connectivity, but like no idea what the impact is, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like really big nonprofits, no idea what the impact is. So you, you have uh, built the funding model that aligns with how, where I believe the impact is, but when you are resource strapped running a nonprofit, you wish you had the resources of <laughs> the Red Cross or like all these other, all these other places. So I'm glad that you all are kind of honing in at least where I feel like my values align too, but that dichotomy is there. Or I don't even know it's dichotomy that, that, that like that question for me is there. Like, why is it that the boys and girls club has real estate all over the place, but I don't really understand what the tangible impacts of their interventions are. Yeah. And there's two things on that. One is I think that a lot of times what, what, donors or other people get confused about is the difference between what, you know, what we would call outputs versus impact, right? Oh, well, oh, we served the, you know, 5,000 youth. I'm like, oh, that's great. Did, did you actually change anything in their lives? Did they mm-hmm. increase their academic performance? Did they do that? Or did you just have 5,000 kids go through your program? Mm-hmm. And I think what people hear is, oh, you served, you know, 5,000 more kids in this group. So you must be doing it better. And I'm like, that's where you get confused versus versus another group that maybe we have a smaller impact, but we're getting this group through college. They're graduating at higher rates. They're going on to getting jobs. They're going to do this. They're going to, you know, we have all these, like you said, these impacts that we can actually measure. Um, because measuring outcomes are, is hard. It's hard to measure the impact, you know, that we have this one intervention in middle school and now the kid is going on to college can we say that our intervention is the one that caused that, or at least can I, how can we link those two together versus it's much easier to just say, yeah, you know, we had, we had 15 kids in our workshop mm-hmm. and it was a six week program and, you know, they graduated and they went on their merry way and you can just count the numbers and the good big groups are really good at counting numbers and they'll, they'll, they'll be able to send a lot of numbers out at you and, and all of that. But again, a lot of that work, 
is that it's that same, it's that old, that kind of, that, you know, kind of, you know, I don't want to call it a cliche phrase, but right. There's either there's, you can, you can give somebody a bed for the night. You can give them a meal, right. You can give them a fish or you can really teach them how to fish and you can, you can, you can address why are they homeless instead of just saying, well, we're going to give them a bed, but actually let's back that up and let's look at that particularly in youth homelessness, most of these kids came, were former foster kid youth, right? They transitioned out of the foster care. They didn't have any career skills. They, you know, maybe they didn't even graduate from high school. They don't have any kind of post high school degree. So instead of just focusing on giving somebody a bed for the night, why don't we say, hey, how do we do some career development work and get these kids some coding skills or some tech skills or other skills where they can get a job and then we don't have to provide a bed because now they can afford their own place. So that's the difference I think is that where a lot of groups do a lot of what I think of that safety net work, which is really critical, you know, housing, emergency housing, shelters, you know, food relief, the food pantry, all of those types of things, vital, incredibly vital business. But then there's another set of organizations that are trying to work at what, what are the issues that are really the underlying causes of that. And that works harder. It's harder to talk about. It's harder to measure. Um, and so for those groups, it's oftentimes, it's harder for them to really get traction um, in, in the space because they don't have the gaudy numbers. They have, you know, it's a more of a slow kind of steady slog that they don't need to really work at um, to get there. But those are the groups that oftentimes really, when you see the difference in the, in the kids' lives or in anybody's lives in, in the work that we do, it's those groups that really can make a, a true lasting impact. We're, we're approaching the top of the hour and I have my rapid fire round of questions to close out our discussion. This is David Greco, Cook on Monday morning. You ready, David, for the rapid fire? Fire away. <laughs> okay. Do you meditate? Not as much as I should, but yes. <laughs> okay. What book would you recommend? Oh my God, why am I blanking on the, on the, on the name? I'm going to come back to it. I'm going to come back to it. Okay. Do you have a motto? Uh, no, I actually don't have a motto. That's, not, that's an interesting idea. That's, I'll, I'll try and come up with one. I don't have one. What personal weakness can you forgive in someone? I, you know, to me, to me I, I don't know if it's a personal weakness, but you know, I can always forgive somebody who's, who's made a real honest mistake, that they, that they really tried to do the right thing and they just, they, they, there was just you know, a mistake. And so to me... I always think that if somebody has the right intention of what they're doing and they just executed it really wrongly um, or poorly, you know, that I can always forget. Um, but I can't, when somebody's really in it just for themselves or they're, they're, they're doing something and that damages an organization or damages the people that you're trying to serve, to me, that's, that's where I, I have, I, you know, I, I, I have a really hard time forgiving on that, on that level. Are you ready for the book now? Oh, the book. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, I actually, I, I, it is actually, it is one of my favorite books. So um, uh, I was just, so the Zen Mind Beginner's Mind, which is uh, Suzuki Roshi, a Roshi uh, um, from the Zen Center there in San Francisco, a book that he wrote. I read that book a number of years ago, and it really, I, it really did help provide me with, um, uh, you know, it's a, a, a really great way of, I think, just working at the world. Because one of the things I think for him, even though he's a Buddhist kind of monk and teacher and writer, he's very down to earth and very like practical and, and real world. And so to me, I, I thought some of the advice that he really gave in, in, in that book um, helped me um, a, a, a tremendous amount. The other one is, uh, the other book that I always recommend is by Parker Palmer. It's a book called Let Your Life Speak. Um, and why I always love that book is that what he writes about is that uh, people always say, like, this is what I'm going to do with my life. I'm going to do this and this and this. And he said, actually, what you need to do is step back and like, listen to what your, your life is really telling you you should be doing. Um, and it's sort of, oftentimes when we try and do something that's really kind of against who we are, that we become miserable. And he said, if you really want to be happy in your life, find something, you know, really listen to what your, 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 your instincts are telling you and your kind of soul and spirit is telling you, and you'll be happy. So let your life speak and then uh, Zen Mind, Beginner Mind. Um, mm -hmm. Both are, 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 are amazing books. You, know, you got two. You got two for <laughs> that works. That <laughs> works. No problem. <laughs> okay. Last to final question. The house is on fire. Your family and the pets are out. What are three things you grab? 
to me, I, yeah, I, I don't know what to call them. I, keepsakes, memorabilia, things like that. I mean, we, my, 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 my partner and I, she, she, we, we keep these, uh, like, we, we do, we keep these scrapbooks of like, of, and, and so when, uh, on our first anniversary, I, I had put together this like scrapbook for like all the stuff that we did. And then every year we've been doing that. So I don't know if I could grab all of those, uh-huh. <laughs> but those are the type of, type of things. Cause I think that's like, to me, those are our memories. Those are things that they're not digital pictures. They're, they're things that, that really kind of, uh, you know, remind us of all, all that we, we've done together as, as a couple. So I, those are the types of things that I think I, I, I would take with us. Clothes and computers and stuff like that. That's, that's, that's all replaceable. But that, those types of things that really are kind of meaningful to me personally and particularly my relationship with the people that I love. Um, I, you know, those are what I want to bring. If, if everyone else is safe, those are what I want to bring. Okay. That concludes my discussion with Mr. Greco. Uh, thank you, sir, for sharing your insights, experience, and um, your journey. Uh, I appreciate you joining me today. All right. Thank you so much. <laughs> peace, peace. And thank you for listening to another episode of Cook on Monday Morning. At Cook on Monday Morning, we are building lives and make us excited about Monday morning. We believe that if you can own Monday morning, you can own the week. If you can own the week, you can own the year. And if you change your year, you can change your life. I'd like to thank our listeners and those that continue to subscribe to the podcast via the Cook on Monday Morning YouTube channel. I'm grateful to all of you for your support. Thank you. Please share the podcast with a friend. Help us grow this community of doers. Please also take a minute to subscribe to the podcast wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you have a minute, uh, rate and review it on Apple. It helps people find it and it helps a lot. If you're interested in starting a podcast, I wrote an article. It's called How to Start a Podcast During the Pandemic. Uh, It goes over all the equipment that we use for the show. And I have some book recommendations. So you can get access to that article in the description box. Cook on Monday Morning is a product of the Luther Harris Holding Company. Uh, We work in partnership to create solutions that drive social impact. We do that by building strategic partnerships between businesses and government. We recruit diversity talent to high impact roles, and we help companies drive impact in the communities where they do business. If you'd like to learn more, please email me at info at I'd like to thank our listeners again and the people that make this podcast possible, our videographer, David Topete. Thank you, sir. I'd like to thank our copy editors, Fernando Cinco Marquez and Devin Sketchinger. Thank you both us as well. I get up every morning with the intention to create value and showcase love to the people that keep our cities moving. They are our teachers, school lunch workers, custodians, uh, social workers, firefighters, police officers, EMT workers, garbage collectors, bus drivers, and nurses. They are our employers, the folks creating jobs and keeping our economy moving. They are our gig workers, stocking our shelves, driving our ride shares, delivering our food. To all of you, this podcast is for you. You live in places like San Francisco, Oakland, Richmond, Antioch, San Mateo, Los Angeles, Dallas, Houston, New Orleans, Baton Rouge, Miami, Orlando, the Carolinas, Virginia Beach, Milwaukee, Kansas City, Cleveland, Detroit, Harlem, Brooklyn. And shout out to all of our listeners in Nigeria, Ghana, Kenya, Jamaica, and Ethiopia, this podcast is for you. This podcast is for all of you. And this message that we are building continues to touch the world because of you. Until we meet again. Peace, peace, and we out.